So we will start the final session of SOCIA 2020. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, try to contain your disappointment, but all good things must come to an end. Uh, Ted, you want to start us off? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'd like to share the screen. And can I just automatically? Oh, it looks like I can do that. Wonderful. Um, so you may have uh, seen the uh, earlier video. I want to do an astroethics of responsibility and care. And I'm responding to a problem, uh, intellectual problem that arose at Princeton 10 years ago. Uh, Margaret Race and John Brenner and others sponsored a Coast Bar workshop on ethical considerations for uh, planetary protection off Earth. And as the uh, days rolled on, the scientists in the room kept asking about intrinsic value of life in off Earth uh, biospheres and uh, eventually uh, formulated some resolutions. Here's an example. Inherent in the conduct of scientific exploration is the need to protect potential extraterrestrial life. I want you to focus on inherent in the conduct of scientific exploration. One of the recommendations was life, including extraterrestrial life, has special ethical status. Is that a scientific statement? A number of uh, ethicists were present uh, there, Linda Billings, um, uh, among others, and uh, Jacques Arnaud, who's an ethicist at um, the French Space Agency in Paris, uh, he threw a conniption fit. And uh, he and I were talking in the hall and uh, he was uh, vituperating and um, whenever a French person throws a conniption fit, it's still a lot more charming than an English speaking person. And so Margaret Race came out and said, well, what's going on? And uh, so Jacques says, this is not ethics. <laughs> Uh, this is just, uh, you know, self-centered aggrandizement because the scientists want to preserve off-Earth sites for scientific research so that uh, the commercial world doesn't go there and destroy those sites, uh, you know, through extraterrestrial mining. And uh, Margaret says, well, you got to come in, you got to tell everybody. Well, no, no. And she insisted. And then I can't remember what happened whether Jacques spoke or I spoke, I, I don't remember. But here's the, the question that uh, has bugged me since. And by the way, I like the fact that the scientists want to treat uh, off earth life um, with intrinsic value. I like that a lot, but can you do that as a scientist or not? That's my question. So here's Grace, Grace Wolf Chase at the Adler Planetarium, although science can and arguably should inform ethics, science cannot dictate ethics. Well, can science even provide a foundation for ethics? So why is this a problem? Well, I spent a lot of time in my uh, little video that I won't repeat here saying, well, Western culture made a decision about three, 400 years ago uh, to whack a uh, human knowing uh, into two separate and impermeable categories, subjectivity and objectivity. And the, uh, the science has got the objectivity side of it. So uh, we look for facts so we're value neutral and all of that kind of thing. And uh, where did the ethicists go? Well, they went over the subjective side. Uh, ethics, morality, value, art, <laughs> history, everything got put on the side of subjective perspectivalism. So if we're serious about the subject object split, and if we're serious about va value neutrality within 
science, then there is no inherent moral uh, demand that we protect life on Earth or off Earth or anywhere else. Well, I'm, I'm wondering how can we provide uh, some undergirding or retrofitting uh, for this scientific concern. So I'm going to try to piece together three steps that would lead to the uh, uh, moral value of the protection of uh, biospheres on off Earth locations. I'm going to start with Hans Jonas, who is not satisfied uh, with this subject object split. He wants to find in nature a source of value. And he locates it in the observation that life strives, strives to remain alive, not necessarily each individual organism, but the species <laughs> strives to perpetuate itself. And by observing this, he says, we need to respect it. We need to respond. So he has a responsibility ethics. Does he violate the naturalistic fallacy, uh, fallacy proscription? Um, Yes, of course, there, there are a couple ways of defining the naturalistic fallacy. Uh, one way is to say you can't start with an is and then move to an ought. Uh, another way is nature cannot tell us what to value. Uh, Jonas does violate that uh, proscription and he tries to do it within science. And ordinarily, I like to observe the proscription, but in this case, maybe I'm going to concede uh, that maybe there's something there. Then step two, I want to go to the golden rule. Uh, Jesus says, do to others as you would have them do to you. And um, uh, you might say, oh, you can't use the golden rule. You see, that's a religious perspective. And we don't allow religious perspectives uh, into uh, a scientized uh, ethic. Uh, Martin Luther interprets Jesus's golden rule as something that nature teaches. Jesus and nature just happen to coincide. Uh, then we get to Edward O. Wilson, who is no friend of religion, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he likes the golden rule. The golden rule is perhaps the, uh, it's a principle that's found in all organized religions, and therefore it's fundamental to moral reasoning. So um, I'm wondering, does this count? Uh, with Immanuel Kant, we, uh, we get beyond just treating someone else the way we ourselves want to be treated. We now add dignity. And so we're talking about caring for the other. And we're caring for the other in terms of his or her intrinsic value. Oh, yes, instrumental value is still obtained. But the intrinsic value trumps it. Now, and Kant, uh, of course, is a post Cartesian split. So he lives in the same world of science that we do. Third step concept of the common good. It has many sources, but in recent decades, it's been the uh, Catholic ethicists who've emphasized the common good. If we're really going to care for the other via the golden rule, you have to do so within a larger social structure in which the common good actually feeds the little goods of uh, those of us who uh, make it up. And uh, so I'm going to ask, um, what is the scope of the common good? Well, we've got a, a few people, Stephen Dick and John Hart and some others uh, who want to expand the common good to the, the cosmos. Um, I think the cosmos is a little bit big. I cannot imagine practically interaction with anything beyond the, the Milky Way. Um, so I, I like the idea of the uh, galactic common good, although some of my friends say, Ted, even that is a little bit unrealistic. 
I think we can think of two moral spheres, certainly the solar system, the solar neighborhood, uh, in terms of a common good for the solar neighborhood, maybe uh, if we finally do meet ET on an ex exoplanet, maybe we can think in terms of a Milky Way common good. So those are my three steps, strictly a naturalistic observation that life strives to uh, perpetuate itself and that should be respected. That's Hans Jonas's responsibility ethic. Um, then it's a small step to care and even though religious people uh, who uh, should be forbidden from making any contribution to a so-called scientific discussion. Uh, at least there's a certain reasonableness uh, to caring uh, that uh, could be taken seriously. Then the notion of the common good uh, as a way in which to make both the perpetuation of life and caring for uh, life um, uh, reasonable, um, it seems to me that could follow. And uh, so finally, in summary then, uh, and I wasn't able to cover every aspect of this, uh, who should the moral agent be? Well, I think it should be a single planetary society of moral deliberation. That does not exist, uh, but it's worth striving for. Uh, what's the moral norm, the galactic common good? What are the spheres uh, within which this obtains, I think of two, the solar neighborhood and the Milky Way metropolis. And then finally, and this was where we began, what kind of a justification uh, for treating uh, off earth life as having some intrinsic value as well as instrumental value. And I'm gonna to put together some uh, naturalism and uh, some uh, theology in order to uh, uh, move from the respect of life uh, to care for life and then finally the common good um, as the uh, as the framework. Uh, just uh, one more mention uh, this book coming out in the spring I was a co-editor with uh, Cavio Chantori's in Peru and you'll find a number of uh, people here in our social conference are uh, authors in this book, uh, Linda Billings and uh, um, Kelly Smith and a few other, uh, I think Eric Person's got a piece in here, etc. That's all. Okay, uh, Sherry. There we go. Uh, thank you, Ted. This is a, a cool talk. And I was thinking about it last night. Um, uh, and it seems to me like there's a way of, of having both at the same time. So if you're thinking about the common good, I think about the way that David Harrison, who's a linguist who does um, works with dying languages, tries to sell the idea of preserving these languages with fewer than 10,000 speakers. You know, the argument can be made, who cares? You know, it's just 10,000 people. It's just a language. They're all bilingual anyway. It doesn't matter. But what, the way he looks at it is is this. Um, so if you if you if you fully investigate the lexicon in particular of a dying language in its cu cultural context, you might find that they have words for well, like one of the languages of the Solomon Islands that I was working on for a while had just a horrendous number of words for different kinds of yams that I just never <laughs> even imagined. Yeah, the, yeah I don't. And it, it, I, they're not in the, they're not in the dictionary we made because we could not sort them out and not being in the Solomon Islands at the time we just had no idea, but but those um, words for different kinds of species that have been observed for thousands of years by folks, um, and in particular David Harrison was saying says that um, words for herbs that cure so. There's um, lore built into the to, into these languages and expressed in their lexicons about what herb is good for what illness that Western medicine um, hasn't sorted out yet. That that information arrived at by trial and error, you know, the, uh, is there, and it's 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 retrievable from the language now. But if we let the language die, then it's not retrievable. So it seems like you get you get both things. You get the intrinsic good 
uh, and value of a, of a language being preserved, but also secretly it's good for us uh, measurably and objectively at the same time. And I'm wondering how that fits in with what you're thinking. <clears throat> well, on the one, uh, I think that um, instrumental value and intrinsic value are not mutually exclusive. Uh, for Kant, um, a rational person has intrinsic value that ought not to be sacrificed for instrumental value. I think with regard to uh, the preservation of languages, which um, on the one hand, it, they have intrinsic value. We kind of love the human, the history of the human race. And uh, so it has value uh, in itself. I think the distinction between yams um, uh, could be of interest from the historian's point of view, and who knows, it might have instrumental value uh, in the future if uh, you're Safeway or something, and you want to sell all these labs and yams and uh, uh, kind of advertise that uh, upscale people know the difference between <laughs> these yams. That would be the instrumental value. But I think the primary interest on the part of scholars for preserving these languages is going to be intrinsic value. There's just something inherent uh, about our past that we want to maintain. We also and, have and the chances are, if we found uh, a biosphere um, uh, on Mars or uh, another, or a moon of Saturn, the scientists are going to want to oh, learn everything about it, study its history, etc., because it's intrinsically interesting and we don't want bulldozers uh you know <laughs> destroying it and i think i think part of it, the, the linguistic uh, argument is parallel to the biological argument you want to study languages so you know what language is like so you know what human cognition is like if you're a cognitivist like me if you're a chomsky linguist maybe it doesn't matter so much um but the same thing is of course true with the intrinsic value of other kinds of life, even if it's a microbe, there's still things that you could learn from it. And, you know, what if you grind that microbe up and it cures cancer, right? So not, yeah. that, not, that, I, not that I'm for it, that sort of thing, but I think that kind of argument uh, helps people who have trouble with intrinsic value kind of get on board. And thank you, that's a, a really good, I enjoyed the talk very much. Good, thanks, Sherry. Linda. Unmute. Great talk, Ted, of course. Um, I like your question, how can we justify ethics for public policy? Uh, we, <laughs> the social group here, I'm sure can, but how do we do that? And um, not to get too political here, but for the past four years, ethics have been thrown out the window in policy making, uh, in policy wrecking, <laughs> good policies <laughs> at the place. Um, and I, I continue to find the Cartesian split so problematic. I'm a social constructionist. So uh, for me, facts are social construction, science is value laden. Um, and this kind of separation in mainstream thinking between objective and subjective is, is a real problem where we, uh, it, it, if we wanna do things rationally, we can't think about values. Um, I do not like that at all. Um, and you made me think about how um, the United Nations, uh, through many mechanisms, including the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, has tried to um, enshrine uh, global ethics and global values, but how effective are those mechanisms? How effective are those tools? Uh, for instance, um, the US government has decided that uh, declaring that space is a war fighting domain and standing up this humongous space force um, is not uh, contrary to our obligations uh, to the treaty. I think it is contrary to our obligations to the treaty. But um, you raise a lot of good points, and thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, Jim. Yeah. So, um, not sure if this came up in your in your summary, but I was thinking about uh, how you're sort of extending this golden rule type uh, approach to to sort of scale of planets, and um, I, I worry that a problem similar to problem with Kant and, and maxims could arise, which is 
you know, how general or specific are you when you're describing your situation and the circumstances that you're trying to, to universalize? Um, so when I'm thinking about Earth as a moral agent, you know, what, what, what's included in that? It, does it include the fact that Earth contains life? Does it include the fact that Earth contains intelligent life? Does it include the fact that Earth contains rational deliberators? Uh, and, and how much of that goes into uh, identifying Earth as a place that, you know, I'm just using the Kantian metaphor here, but uh, as a place of dignity in, in contrast to other planets. So is Mars kind of like um, uh, a barren landscape in that regard? Is Mars kind of like a pet? Because Kant will tell us we shouldn't uh, hurt our pets because then it makes us colder to ourselves. Um, so, you know, I'm wondering um, what, what, what becomes valuable here that, that isn't already recognized to be valuable uh, on this picture? Um, in, in the Reno uh, discussion a couple of years ago, um, a few of us asked, well, who speaks for Earth? It, it was in the context of the many discussion, but be that as it may, um, whenever uh, we're dealing, I think, with off-Earth uh, uh, ethics, especially because it might impinge on, uh, you know, existential issues surrounding uh, our entire planet, um, that thinking of all human beings on planet Earth do have a vested interest in the future of, uh, of space, but they're not part of uh, the moral deliberation uh, that goes on. Um, and so it just strikes me that on the list of our ethical to-dos, uh, there needs to be uh, not only consideration of the welfare um, of uh, everybody on Earth, but also um, uh, to draw them into uh, the discussion when it comes to making public policy. So that was the level um, on which I want to uh, do this. I've also noticed that... Um, people engaged in astroethics frequently borrow um, ecological concerns uh, already established for the health of the planet and then export them uh, to outer space, which I think is a satisfactory method. Uh, and so there's a holism about planet Earth in, in that kind of thinking. Okay. 